Good morning, everybody. I am Chris P, and today I am thrilled to be joined by Tim Bradbury. Um, Tim has become a friend over the over the last couple of years, and a, a confidant, and a and a bit of a uh, send information and help in my knowledge. So today we're in for a good one. Um, Tim, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And if ever, somebody could just type into the chat box that you can hear us okay and see us. If we do lose sound or video, bear with us. Uh, it is the technology we deal with, as in the words of Ali G. But anyway, without any further ado, welcome, Mr. Bradbury. Uh, give us your journey, Tim. Uh, good morning, Chris, and thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity. The trajectory was, a, I guess, a long one and a problematic one in that I was born in Stoke-on-Trent, uh, very proud of the fact I was a youth player who dreamt of playing the professional game. I went through sixth form college, did some A-levels, all along believing I'd be uh, the next Alan Hudson to give it a Stoke City frame for those who were of my age. Tried out for Port Vale and was promptly told, you're just too slow. Sort of shattered my dreams. Uh, started coaching almost immediately in the youth team that I played for, almost as a player coach. I guess the connection is at that time I was very socially aware. So. It was the time of the miners' strike, uh, it was the time of Margaret Thatcher, and I was that kid who wanted to go and join the miners on the picket lines. So my social awareness, I think, connected with the values, probably from the musical world. I was a big jam fan and Paul Waller, and it's part of the thing that, I guess, built me. Led to me being a coach who was always about what could I get out of people? What was the best thing that we could do as a group together? What were the values that would help us become excellent? So eventually finished my A licenses, jump off to London to Borough Road, which was one of the old PE wing colleges, where one of the lecturers was Tom Tranter. Tom Tranter worked with Charlie Hughes on the facts book and the winning formula to age me again. So studied under Tom. Tom identified me as a uh, coach and educator had me teach different FA little events around Brentford and Isleworth and the places we were. Uh, eventually finished my teaching degree and was lucky enough to get the teaching award. At the same time I'd done my prelim and when I finished I was going to start a master's degree in education. So Tom was kind enough to allow me to teach at Borough Road on the soccer course that they'd created. So I'm playing semi-professional, I'm teaching soccer, uh, I think it's all great. I'm doing a master's degree in sociology and education. And then a gentleman called Gary Book, who now coaches at Adelphi University, comes to London and says, come and try life on a soccer camp in America. At the time when I guess NASC and Britannia, uh, Naga or Long Island soccer camps were all dominating. That was 25 years ago, came over, never looked back, came over, became, after one season, the person that Gary trusted in educating all the other coaches that were coming over. So we took Noga to a year-round training business pretty quickly, and my job was to do the coach education piece, which Brilliant. involved training thousands of Brits, many of which have now really gone on and achieved great things. Same time, met United Coaches or the NSCAA and started teaching diplomas. I was still along thinking I'd like to work for US soccer. Eventually got a connection to start teaching old Federation courses. And back in the day, I've no problem being honest about this, they were very thin. Each instructor was teaching whatever they wanted. And luckily with US soccer, I've been part of the journey with the grassroots courses and now uh, part of the instructor of educators, educator instructor group. So completely changed uh, the corner with US soccer in that a lot of staff development, very definite approach. I'm quite proud to wear the badge and call myself a US soccer instructor. Fantastic. And uh, I do believe we have a couple of uh, former coaches on this as well. Uh, if I look at the audience, Twitch, 
Twitch is on, and I'm sure we can unmute Twitch at some stage. So Twitch, be ready. You're on. You're on notice, Alex. Um, Doctor Twitchin, I should say. Um, so tell us what what did that. Uh, We'll, we'll go with the coaching education with the, the the Long Island stuff and Gary Brooks. But what did that look like? What did that entail? Tim, it was funny because education part. when we first came, there was no professional trainers on Long Island. So it was all parent coaches. Uh, Gary and I went out and started training teams. Now Long Island has got more 125 training companies. To give you some sort of perspective. Back in the day, I was thinking about this. We used to go out and do parent clinics. And it was like the movie, if you build it, they will come, the field of dreams. We would uh, post a training clinic for parents on a field and 60, 70 parents would come out for a 90 minute clinic. So just an incredible time when there seemed to be a desperate desire from everybody to learn about methods and approaches to bringing the game alive to kids in a fun way i think the thing that or the synergy that strikes out is i hated drills i was even as a kid i was a bit dysfunctional in that when we played tennis at school 36 kids in a line two rackets teacher held a racket we shared one racket for 36 kids so we spent a long time in a line i found way to have fun in that line but developed a hatred for drills and rote learning that uh, has stuck with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Similar PE experience, right? And uh, similar philosophy. Um, I had I had fun in the, in the line, which was usually at somebody else's expense by the flicking ears and or, or become disruptive, right? And uh, so, you know, tell us these coaches that were coming over. There was no professional trainers. What what did that look like? Was it like uh, you know, for us, you know, because I was a NASC guy, it was his our curriculum. We did a couple of inductions in Sheffield. We had a couple of trainings, um, you know, with people like Dan Gaspar and Gary Russell came over, um, who was a big into psychology. And then it was run. A Nobody actually saw us coach or do things. It was watch how to do it. Right. How was it with the Noga guys? And by the way, Neil Phillips, who's ex Noga on, says, hi, Tim, I'm on. And he's here as well. Good old friend. We did it differently in that we didn't have enough money to do mass publicity to let people know what we were. So my big thing was that any coach who was coaching for Naga stood naked in a field. Anybody watching should know it was a Naga coach. They should know from the way the kids were greeted, from the amount of activity, from the amount of problem solving. Uh, it should just have something that made it look Nogger. The only way we could make that stick was with continuous education. So we quickly evolved to a place where it wasn't just two clinics, it was continuous ongoing clinics. So we would do two sessions a week over 12 weeks each season. And it combined two things. Often the coaches we brought in would arrive off the plane believing, okay, I'm a coach, done my FA badge or I've got my prelim or whatever. And we became quickly aware that that was very limited, that we needed to do a lot of work so that the Naga coaching philosophy at that time really showed in each session. Yeah. So was it a, a combination of on the grass and in the classroom or? All on the grass. All on the grass. Brilliant. Brilliant. And then did you, was it like an old coaching license, for example, where you'd, you'd show and then some of the, the other coaches, the training coaches would go through yeah. and then get feedback. Basically, from we would model and they would then get chance to deliver different sessions with input and feedback. Mm -hmm. Which I can imagine helped the philosophy grow and, and go on. Yeah, but we um, also had time to go out and watch them when they were coaching their teams towards the end of it. So we would both watch them coach their peers. Uh, some fun sessions where they were role playing being five year olds. Because yeah. we did the age group, we did, it was from five to 18. We wanted coaches to be able to deal with and be great with each and every age group, which was a bit unusual. Yeah, as opposed to having somebody just specialise and just say, you stay with this age group and so on and so forth. Just understanding the whole child, as it were. Absolutely. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. Now, 
Um, you, you talked about, you know, coming over 25 years ago and then getting with USC, which formerly NSCAA, and then just wanting to be that instructor with US soccer. And congratulations, you got there, right? We just had Albert Capellas on the other day who was with Barcelona, and he always said, dream big, follow your dreams, follow your dreams, follow your dreams. You, you mentioned at the beginning that the US soccer stuff was a little bit thin, and we, we don't need to go past down that journey because I think I had an experience with a thin journey back in 2002, I think, in Vegas uh, with US soccer. But talk about where it's gone now um, and with the grassroots courses, um, the grassroots instructor's license. And, you, you know, before we started recording, you said it, you were training like for a couple of years. You're working with a group of guys um, for two years to start delivering these grassroots instructor's license. So let's talk a little bit about that. And then let's talk about the impact you think that will have once we're able to measure um, that. Yeah, so I'll track the whole thing. I think you have to give credit to Dave Chesler and Vince Gansberg at the start of that process, because they were the two that really turned US soccer around, in my opinion. We went to some regional staff training where Dave and Vince had us present parts of the e-license that had been reformatted and given a new life. And it was the first time in a long time where as a professional educator, somebody watched me present within the classroom, evaluated me and gave me great feedback, uh, constructive, critical. But I just felt it was almost a home at that point and that I was always looking for people to say to me, Tim, you can do this better. Tim, this is something that is a, a place where you can improve. This is something you're very good at. So some affirmations, but also some guidance. So Dave and Vince gave me that, which obviously gave me a home and loyalty. And then as Nico came in and Ches was moved sideways, that's when we started, I was invited from Scott Flood to be part of this 12 person group involved Tom Turner, Gareth Smith, Ian Mulner, uh, to name some mentionable friends. And it was just a great journey. We spent two years, lots of meetings, a very open environment. There was a lot of psychological safety. We felt we could say whatever we wanted. There was certainly some battles, uh, battles about online education, which considering where we are now are quite comical. Uh, battles about skill acquisition and where it was and ball contact time. So many very honest and candid conversations, which is obviously a great thing. It was after the two year journey and testing the courses, Frank Tushan, who's now back in journey, was a vital part of this. It just became uh, something that we all believed in. And the play practice, play method and the six tasks. I think the things I'd noticed if you look back on education within America, it's just so myopic to believe that it's all about just the coach, what the coach does on a field. It's a bit embarrassing for me that for years and years, we just taught people go run a session. That's all coaching is. Whereas via the six tasks, hopefully most people are aware that coaching is a craft that involves so many more skills. And I believe that that was one of the phenomenal changes that came out of the grassroots courses. Yeah, brilliant. And uh, people who are on, they should know the six tax tasks. If they don't, you can start typing them in just so we can have a little bit of question and answer and a little bit of uh, audience participation there. Um, I'll give you the first one, coaching games. <laughs> and then there's uh, five more. And leadership features heavily in there. So uh, if you got, just to check if people are awake, jump in. So, uh, oh, we got some questions coming in. We got sponsors coming in. Uh, coaching a training session, Jeff Muir from Missouri Rush. Well done, Jeff, of course. Jeff, give us another one. Um, Twitch, get ready. Um, so you talk about the play, practice, play, which is the methodology that's been um, used. And, you know, yourself, oh, Jeff Muir's given them more, leading the player, leading the team. Leadership, Jeff Muir's got it. Jeff, as a state association director, you should have those answers, but thank you for sharing. Um, 
the play practice play methodology let's let's talk a little bit about that and uh, your thoughts on that um, exclusive well it doesn't need to be exclusive from US soccer but what uh, what are the benefits that you've seen uh, from play practice play because I know what usually comes up is is oh, the Federation is not talking about technique which is a misunderstanding because we do talk about technique and skill acquisition um, and I know that the instructors, when they, once they've gone through their grassroots instructor's license, they somewhat have to follow the slide deck. Um, you know, so let, let's, a lot to unpack there. Um, I yeah, I think there's several things that you have to note. Uh, let's begin with play, practice, play. I think it's openly acknowledged, depending on the experience of an instructor, that there's 14 methods that a youth coach can use. And we certainly believe in helping coaches within their context but for me it's not a contradiction to say okay there's these 14 methods but based upon our knowledge of grassroots players the spaces that you have and can train within that this specific method at this point in time has got more more value than the others and if i look back to comments about youth players within america it was always oh well they lack game savvy they can't figure the game out on their own. They can't figure out 3v3. Uh, they can't deal with the reality of finding a 2v1, etc., etc. So we look for a model that would help solve those problems. And a model that helps those solve problems is obviously heavily based upon playing the game. And play, practice, play, with its different stages through free play initially and small-sided type games through the, the middle three stages of a practice to the game obviously is heavily game based yeah i think the uh, let's deal with the slide deck issue what a good instructor does is the candidates come through the door is track their desires and needs why are they here and hopefully it goes up on a post-it uh, and as part of that post-it you start to sort of record well this is an emphasis for this class. Then as you go through the deck, slides get emphasis or slides get sort of sped through. Because you try and build the context, as any good educator does in my opinion, you build the context of the course based upon the needs of the candidates in front of you. I think where we're heading, uh, as Twitch alludes to with these open university courses, individualized coaching courses, where we're trying to meet every candidate where they're at, where their needs are, and push them as far as we possibly can forward on their journey. Yeah, huge. And um, maybe that's a good time to uh, bring Twitch in if he's available um, and expand on that if you don't mind, Tim. Not at all. I'm sure Twitch can help, but if anybody, I don't know if Twitch mentioned it on his webinar with you, but uh, designed a very good coach developer course. It's a 24 hour course. Uh, really got some great modules within it and it's on great synergies with what we're doing with US soccer. Yeah, Twitch, we did talk a little bit about the course and I'm, I'm unmuting you now, Twitch. Dr. Twitch in, welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon back here in the UK. Good to see you, Tim. Good to see you. Now, I'd just like to, okay. um, well, maybe start off by just endorsing what Tim's been saying. Um, I think we've got some interesting developments starting to happen here in, um, well, in England anyway. Um, the FA might be moving towards quite a different approach to coach education, uh, possibly moving away from a traditional course in the way that it's been run in the past. And coaches will pick up workshops which might be relevant to their coaching context. Um, so we've just had a couple of initial conversations um, around that um so yeah it could be uh it could be quite exciting brilliant, brilliant um switching it yeah sorry go on oh carry on alex no i was just going to say i think um you know the more we the more we learn about learning and the more we reflect i think the more we understand how coaches learn and therefore what are the requirements of the system that they learn in and also then, what are the requirements of the workforce who support their learning? Um, 
and then that's kind of like a, a little bit of a puzzle that needs to be fitted together. Yeah, brilliant. And uh, thanks for joining us, Alex. That's okay. Um, I noticed you just said it was nice to him, not myself. So I'm going to mute you now, Alice. Okay. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding to each other. Um, the, the course that you talk about, Tim, was absolutely fantastic. I think I came across it um, and, and the course, and we actually did a jigsaw learning piece about that. So we had eight ment uh, six mentees um, within the Rush program that um, took a couple of pieces of the course and then reported back to the other pieces, which I've got to give Twitch the feedback on that as well, actually. But it was, it was very good. And I think it's interesting, um, and you hit the nail on the head, is just making it learn entered right the the grassroots stuff and making sure that we are assessing the needs of the candidates that are in front of us um i just recently finished my b license and i and i felt that way and I, there was such a marked difference from my c license experience to the b license experience um and you know it, it was evident that the the work that the federation and, and yourself and the people involved have done to make it, you know, about the candidate was, it was huge and stark, the differences. So kudos to everybody who was involved in our course, but also in in making sure that that's the quality, you know, that that's needed. Um, just going back to the grassroots stuff and the play practice play, the there's a big movement right now, right, with skill acquisition, you know, uh, Talk to us a little bit about skill acquisition and uh, as opposed to individual training or okay, isolated it's, training. It's a, obviously, it's a fascinating time in the there's a difference between technical foundation and skill. Skill, perception, action, coupling is a decision in a game. Decision in a game based upon the movement of players around you, the pressure on a ball, which is wrapped up in how quickly I can move, how quickly my body can change direction and all those thousands of things that a kid has to put into that decision, as opposed to pure technique, which is divorced of a decision. Uh, as we go through COVID, obviously what's interesting is for years I tried, and I think many companies tried to get kids to do soccer homework, which was probably why it never worked, just a horrible phrase. Go and find ways to have fun with a ball at home, whether it be juggling scores or passing against the wall. That for me is the only place for block or even some random learning because you can create individual games or games with a partner. Uh, I used to play with a friend who played for Stoke where we would get garbage pails and have to chip a ball to each other and chest it into the pail to score a point and just vary the distances. So 15 yards apart, 30 yards apart. So for me, that's the place, and that's always the discussion with skill acquisition. The whole mob of people, uh, I don't know if it's a core of a centric piece who believe that, yeah, you've got to spend individual time with the ball. It's got to be uh, hours and hours of you slogging away. I get it. I think it's part of the conversation. And perhaps this is the time where that part of the conversation has got some real value because we'd all like kids to be active with the ball, to stay connected to the game, uh, to have some hope that we'll get back out on a field. So I think that part is key. Whilst recognising that if I've got a group of kids together and I can create a game-like situation, 3v2, 2v1 to goal, 1v1, much more chance of creating a moment where some skill might be applied in a game situation. And I believe we want skillful players as opposed to technically great players. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, and I think you, you, the term you use there, you know, perception, action, action coupling, right? Um, people are trying to separate the two in, in the isolated training stuff. And it, it's, um, it, it can be boring at times for a kid, right? To just sit there and do, you know, six Cruyff turns with no pressure and not apply them you know and I think the great man himself said I, I didn't know what I was going to do but I just did it and it worked so you know so it's it's I think 
I heard it once, it's getting children to fall in love with the ball first and then fall in love with the sport and then skill develops. And it's funny to hear you say like you were you were playing with a friend where you would knock a ball and try and chest it into the garbage can. Um, because I'm sure every English kid in, you know, on this or every coach who's come from England, the headers and volleys, the Wembley, the Kirby, um, everybody played those games, right? And it was dreaming who your hero was, whether it was, uh, you know, I'm trying to pull a Stoke player from, from your day there <laughs> or Cyril Regis, you know, uh, back in the day and, and stuff Garth like Crooks. that. And, pardon? Garth Crooks. Garth Crooks. There you, go. Yeah. Uh, you know, emulating your heroes, but it's, um, and then and then I think over here, we, we, we'll say, well, the kids don't watch it enough. Well, I think kids have more access now through YouTube and whatever channels, uh, NBC Sports who do who do such a wonderful job, even though the Premier League's not on now, they've got the Premier League hundreds, the 30 minute stories, the magic games, which I think may and capture kids a little more now um, to watch yeah, it's, it. It's an interesting conversation because I think that one of the pieces that we've tried to deal with is let's create a, a group of soccer lovers who want to watch a game. And I agree with you, I think we've managed to create a group who will sit and watch the TV but even when things get back to normal, that taking that to going to watch a live game, which is a different look, see and feel, we haven't got to that part yet. We've created this nation of people who will sit in front of La Liga or uh, Bundesliga or EPL, but don't quite have the, the passion to get to watch a game. Yeah, well, I, I think for us here in Virginia Beach, you know, it's a four hour drive to DC United, which we've made, um, but that was only because Man United were playing Barcelona, you know. Um, but, I, you know, having looked at the MLS over the years, the improvement that that's made has been astronomical. You know, we were involved in the Chicago Fire days back when Armas was there when when they first came out in their inaugural year as uh, North American soccer camps became MLS camps. You know, we had to go and do some work on a Saturday at the game, which you know, it, just to see the way that's evolved too has been has been great. And, you know, I think some of the franchises have done a brilliant job in uh, having that atmosphere, you know, that you'd get at, say, an Old Trafford or Villa Park against Birmingham City on a wet, windy Tuesday night. And uh, Enkelman lets the ball under his foot from a throw-in. Um, but <laughs> just creating those memories, you know. Um, so... Tim, there is a question. One of the questions has come in and it says, you mentioned 14 methods of a coach. Do you want to, do you want to touch upon a couple of those methods? And uh, I believe you've written a paper on this and if it's okay to share with the group afterwards, we'll, we'll share it too. Yeah, I'll uh, send out the paper. As part of this building courses that meet the coach in their context, we've all trapped at some point in a quarter of a field, a penalty area, half a field, a full field. It's just part of the typical youth coach experience. So it struck me when I was presenting a premier diploma uh, for United Coaches and asked the, the coaches on the course, just write down your methods. So I was presenting a methods lecture and I got things like uh, asking questions, which is a tool within a method. And I think the most methods that could be mentioned was two. It struck me that we don't service the coaches well unless we can give them some idea of the variety of methods. So you've got small sided games, you've got whole part whole, you've got play practice play, shadow play, phase play, gamification, uh, different progressive methods from OLI, uh, Federation's current method to small sided expanded game. And I think that any coach, we talk about that coach who can work with five-year-olds through 18-year-olds and beyond can't work with that enormous range of people with their learning needs without having access to all the different methods yeah brilliant and for those wondering oli orientation learning implementation tattooed onto my brain after that that uh, b license um i think it's a, i think for me it's just a take a moment to emphasize that for years, coaches, and we talk about player-centered learning, it's difficult to talk player-centered learning if as a coach, you've already decided this is the solution. So coaches would watch a game, 
trot out and say, well, I'm going to do a session on building out the back. That's the solution. And just start with a solution in mind. And can you have player centered learning unless the players understand a problem? Because if you let the players understand a scenario and a problem, then they create their own solutions. And then you can guide, enhance, provide other options. Well, that for me is the essence. And for me, OLI, it's like the drill thing just makes, it's just common sense. If you believe that kids can solve problems and that sh should be part of what we're doing. Yeah. And I think as coaches, we're, we're very quick to jump in to fix things. We're fixers as opposed to coaches, right? And as opposed to observing and letting them uh, solve problems and, you know, well, how are you going to solve that? Well, what did you think? What did you do? You know, I think that's huge, but interesting. So the methods that we'll, we'll share out, but, um, you know, small sided games is a method. And of course, the questioning was part of, would you say guided discovery is a method or would that be a tool? No, it's a tool that a fits across all methods. I think there's, if you're, again, player centered, then guided questions, Socratic method is a tool that sits across methods. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. just some command and, you know, command teaching as well. That's got a place within every method. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, Tim, what uh, what would you say is the best investment you made in yourself? Obviously, you're, you're a learned man. You've done your master's. You're a qualified teacher. You've gone through licenses in England, licenses in the US, whether it's through the Federation and uh, the NSCAA now USC, what would you say is the best investment you made in yourself? It's a difficult question. It's a great question, but difficult. I was a licensed junkie, so did them all. Jumped from NSCAA, uh, Premier. I did the first master coach diploma with NSCAA. Uh, jumped through the A and the B back in the day. I think my A is something 567, so it was quite early in the journey but it was only much further down the line that I informal learning so all the informal learning that I'm going through now I'm not a young chap don't look like I'm a young chap but the informal learning the podcasts the webinars the books the articles uh, as I try and perfect my craft uh, Twitchy's course was a, a great piece. Uh, I'm doing some okay. stuff on motivational interviewing with Rolnik. Did a six weeks course on motivational interviewing that is was a fascinating journey. Uh, Dweck and the growth mindset. So different. I do a lot of work or a lot of conversations with Doug Lemoff. Uh, he's an interesting one for the people listening. Talked a lot with coaches I've taught about VARC on courses and identifying learning styles just in an attempt to get coaches to be uh, dual mo modality when they teach so are they a visual are they uh kinesthetic are they verbal whereas the truth of that matter apparently is that we can all change depending on the context we're places in which learning style that we're trying to place emphasis on so as so i've done more informal stuff i've just found that the journey will never end. Every time I think I've reached the peak and that I've got a few solutions, I get slapped in the face again. It's, I'm well aware that I know nothing. That's yeah. what I would say. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a, a rich answer there. And just keep learning, right? The journey never ends. And I think it was uh, Jack Walton says, uh, the bigger the, the bigger the island, the bigger the coast uncertainty, right? Just keep learning. Um, so, it's, it's it's funny you should say you, you talk about learning styles and and I think uh, have you come across Dr. Richard Bailey's work? I haven't seen it now. Yeah, so he's uh, he works out of the Institute of Sport, but he also believes that learning styles are a bunch of rubbish. Um, he's a he's a man out of England, but he's he's in Germany, but a very learned man. Um, there is a question that's come in uh, from Debbie, retired PE teacher. She says. Uh, how have you changed education coaches today to include the development of kids mm -hmm. and how their brains learn at different ages? I think it's built into good courses in the most courses. US soccer, the old national youth course was great for this. And that <coughs> probably was my introduction to putting the child and child development first. 
you have to understand how to communicate at different ages. So child development on the old national youth license was a key piece that now gets woven into all the other courses. So where are they cognitively? Where are, where are they physically? Where are they psychosocially? Uh, difficult to teach without having some recognition of those key key parts of a kid. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the National Youth Licence was a absolute, uh, it was a brilliant course. It was a brilliant course. And uh, I believe the USC are bringing that back and doing some stuff with it. So that's, uh, it'll be a good rebirth. Um, so just, you talked about Rolnick and the motivational interviewing. What was the, the biggest takeaway from, from Rolnick's work, Dr. Rolnick's work? I think you have to understand the why, first of all. The why came out of a frustration with giving feedback to coaches with our feedback interview, which that combined with some stuff on radical candor. People want to look at the radical candor website. I think you go through this stage where you uh, an to interview a coach and get them to reflect. Reflection is a skill we could all learn more about. Uh, we don't reflect while. It's a spot of cushions piece. Most coaches, when they've done a session, reflect 80% incorrectly, apparently. So let's learn how to reflect so that our guided discovery, how do you think it went, what went well, what do you think you might do differently, and then you can help coaches evolve to some action steps. So I get all that, but I've also sat with a lot of coaches who don't want the guessing game. They want to almost be told, just tell me. So frustration with the quality or the outcome of the interviews led me to some interest in motivational interviewing, which in short is a clinical technique used to work with uh, people with dependencies on drugs and alcohol. And it's really a technique which places the emphasis on them, understanding where they are, suggesting ways to change which you affirm they've come up with the idea you build some detail around it and because it's self-motivated they go away and there's real change yeah and they're the ones that are doing the change talk right once you get yeah. talking about it yeah and it, i think he uses a method called ask offer ask if i'm not mistaken right correct. i think his, it, acronym yeah. was, his, his acronym was ors ors what? correct yeah, I, I couldn't, I, I know affirmation is one of them, but um, yeah, he's, a, he's an interesting character. He's, he's definitely an interesting character. And I, I look at, uh, I'll probably talk to you offline about the course and going about that course as well, but super. Um, so what, what advice, Tim, would you give to your younger self? You know, having been on this journey so far, that's continuing. Um, what advice would you give to your younger self? be less stubborn less stubborn yeah that's good advice and that's actually uh how and, and that it's tied into deborah's question and uh she says how have you you yourself grown with this with this past experience well, Deborah, did you mean within the, covid yeah the be less stubborn piece so yeah. as a nogger educator i would insist people as an example coach without hats because I wanted it to look professional. It should be professional in a good sense of the word, on time with the equipment, well organized, polished, uh, looking like a coach who's actively engaged and now riddled with skin cancer myself and different pieces. I recognize that some things I've done have just been idiotic. So I apologize openly to all the coaches that I said, don't wear a hat. Uh, so that, I think that had to be said. That's why be less stubborn. Uh, tell me the question again, Chris, I'm sorry, I didn't get it. it was, what, what, uh, what growth have you seen in yourself during this time? So as part of the US soccer group, we have personal development plans. Personal development plans are where we've reflected on our ability to teach. This has given me a chance to delve into my personal development plan. Uh, there was pieces on effectiveness of feedback interviews that I'm obviously looking at in depth. Uh, there's some personal missions like methods, uh, presentation on effective feedback that I've been working on. So it's been just 
enormously rich in self-development. I'm learning Spanish via Pimsleur, which could always be funny, a Stoke person trying to speak Spanish, but they will give it a role. Yeah. I was going to ask you to do you like uh, remember Joey Barton's new interview when he was playing in France? Did you ever see that? No, thankfully. <laughs> no, he was actually speaking in this very silly French accent. It's uh, like McLaren's when he was in Holland. I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> no, so we won't ask you to do that. Um, so we'll, we'll start taking questions, more questions from the audience. Keep them coming. Um, Tim, here's a, here's a question that's a, a little different, right? And uh, if you were to able to have six dinner guests, dead or alive, who would they be? What, what, what would that dinner table look like? And uh, would you be the cook, number one? And if you were, what would you cook? What would you cook? So I'd like to be the cook because I'm messing around with trying to be a bit of a chef and it would have to be a shepherd's pie. Oh. I think that's the one thing that I can actually do decently. Uh, the guest is fascinating because it would be guests, some of which, many of which are still alive, that have just influenced me enormously. We'll go with the musical piece. Paul Waller would have to be on the list. I'm a Man United fan. So Alex Ferguson would have to be on the list. Uh, Doug Lemoff, a, 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 just an educator of uh, just phenomenal intelligence and wealth of information would have to be on the list. Uh, then he'd have to be probably a Johan Cruyff just a great player, a player with depth of experience. Uh, and then you'd have to get me someone like Mandela, somebody who changed yeah. the world. You've got one more. You've got one more. My vision would always be Mandela type, yeah. change the world. One more. Uh, Alan Hudson. Alan Hudson. Ex-Chelsea too, probably, right? Probably the greatest uncapped player that ever was in England. Did he play for Chelsea too as well, didn't he? Played for Chelsea as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a that's quite a deep list there, quite a deep list, and uh, I, I like that. And uh, I asked the same question to one of our B license candidates, which was uh, Landon Donovan, and Landon had Gandhi on there. I think he had um, Jesus. <laughs> he said Jesus as well, but uh, it was uh, that's a whole nother that's a whole nother webinar. <laughs> um, so listen, we're we're coming to the end. Um, if people have questions, please type them in. But we'll give them a little minute. Uh, but what? Uh, so obviously, the, everything's going to look different when we get back. Everything from coaching education to coaching training sessions to you know playing the game. Um, what advice would you give to people on the call and uh, who will watch this later for the first training session? What does your first training session look like? I think the first thing, hopefully everyone on there, is about kids. It's people first. And I think you have to understand or try and understand where, where they will be because this is obviously having a toll on our kids not being with their friends, not being able to talk. So I think first practice back, you've got to do the human thing. Just sit down and connect. How that connection will look physically in terms of distance between people. But you've got to give kids a space to express their feelings. I'm sure most of it will be delight. Uh, for me, that first practice has got to be about connection and fun. Yeah. Let's get back to recognising how much we love the game. So let them play. Let them play in a format where they can touch the ball. So I would be pushing small-sided festivals and street soccer type events. Uh, but connect first and foremost. Yeah, connection. Oh, just relationship. Yeah, we. I, I had a little Zoom meeting with the little 2010 and 2011 boys that I coach. And I asked them, you know, what would you want to do? And, and it's exactly what you said. I'd just be so happy to see everybody. Let's play small sided games. I said, I asked them, well, how would we greet each other? How would we greet each other? Would we shake hands? And one kid goes, I, I will give you a hug. And I'm like, ah, I don't think we can do that, you know? Um, but so, so just interesting and, and just, you know, looking through the lens of a child, you know? It's going to be a, an important protocol. It sounds silly, but 
how do you display affection that you obviously feel? Everyone's missing the kids. What will be the protocol? Will it be fake high fives? Will it be fake hugs? But I think coaches would do well to vision a protocol. Let yeah. kids know this is me saying I love you. Yeah. Uh, this is how we're going to do it. Yeah, yeah. There's, it there's, been, there's been some talk of, you know, the heart and then, you, you know, you're in my heart, you're on my mind, um, but also maybe kids kicking feet uh, as opposed to high fives, you know, um, but it's just, I think it's, you're spot on there. And, and of course, if we had the answers, we wouldn't be sitting here, we'd be making millions, maybe if we knew what it would look like with the war, right? Um, questions aren't coming in, Tim. I think you've answered everything so so in depth. So we're going to go Too with some- people are asleep. <laughs> <laughs> they, they might still be sleeping actually. Um, yeah. We're going to go with some one word. I'm going to give you some one worders, right? So I'm going to ask you some questions and you'll get one word answers, right? Time but limit. you can, no, no time limit, no time limit. I just want to, I want to challenge you to think a little. You are a deep thinker. You're a philosopher. So I want to be able to, you know, see that puzzled look upon your face every now and again. And uh, just, uh, we'll go from there. So the first one is skill acquisition. Vital. There you go. See, wasn't too tough. Uh, football. World game. People's game. People's game. England. Home. USA. Uh, sorry, no. FA. The FA. Developing. Twitch, I think that was uh, on because of you there. US soccer. Forward thinking. Love that. That's a hyphen. Forward thinking. Grassroots football. The masses. Masses. Love that. Coach development. Craft. Brilliant. Isolated training. Necessary evil. We'll go with necessary. <laughs> <laughs> Feedback. Vital. Mentor. Motivational. And the final one, coaching education. Lifeblood. Lifeblood. Brilliant. I love it. I love it. There's been no more questions come in. Tim. Um, what, uh, is there any questions I, I could have asked you, should have asked you that I didn't. I think because of my age and experience in doing this, we could have gone down a million different pathways. Obviously the DA conversation has been, or the elite player pathway, let's put it that, and our failure with the elite player pathway has become a hot topic. But uh, no, I think where we went was an enjoyable journey for me. Maybe we'll go with a part two on that one. And uh, maybe part three will be to discuss the methods. Um, and uh, But hopefully we're, we're out of lockdown and moving forward and getting out. And we're too busy for like four and five, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, but uh, if, if people were to reach you, what would be the best way for them to reach you? Uh, Twitter is always the best thing, Tim B, D-O-C-I. I get back to everybody on Twitter, even the people who are trolling me to attack me. Uh, but you can also email me, tbradbury at emysoccer.com. Uh, pretty good with responding because if I don't do it real time, I don't do it. So it happens real time. Brilliant. So there's a couple of statements, um, and this one's from Neil Phillips. I just want to express how thankful I am for Tim's education. It made me the coach I am now. He says, I speak for many Noga coaches from Neil Phillips. So Neil, very glowing endorsement. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, um, Deborah Shaw's just said she's learning sign languages to express sign language to express her feeling. Thanks, Deborah. Um, Twitch says here, here to Neil's comment. So bear with me as I clumsily read through this. Um, this this could take us down a rabbit hole here. This is from Jeff Muir. He says, can you talk about the difference in coaching education pathways philosophy between the USC and US soccer? Do you feel comfortable doing that, Tim? I'll dispel a myth in doing that. 
the myth or the old myth was that Federation want to see you fail. There's all these sorts of curves and that US soccer are all about helping you pass. And it is a myth. I can tell you that on both sides, on both pathways, I'm lucky enough to still teach for both that Every time I meet a candidate, my one desire is, how can I help you achieve the standard of this course? And if I fail, that is me failing. It's not you. It's not the coach in front of me. It means that I didn't find the right language. I didn't create the right culture, the right atmosphere. Uh, so I don't see an enormous difference between the two. I think there's a different feeling within Federation courses because there is still a pass fail and I'm, I've no problem with standards. Coaching education should have a standard within it. Whereas United Coaches is an attendance pass and that's just a different feeling. Well, that different feeling is often not instructor established, it's candidate centered. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great answer. And, you know, I, I would agree and say that the the federation methodology has changed because um, I, I had an absolutely shocking experience with the C license, which I passed, but the B license was, you know, moons and moons away from that C license, you know. And then there is so one my, final so question. My final topic on my A license yeah. back in the day was saving the second shot in an 11 aside game. <laughs> now, obviously, that upset the instructor. It was a session that never got given again and was only ever given once. So I understand the trajectory of US soccer's educational piece. Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's interesting. <laughs> Saving the second shot. So, <laughs> so what if they only had one shot? <laughs> that was a problem in the 11 aside game back in the day when candidates all played. The group I picked. I have to forgive my language, but I picked the cones against the players. Yeah. My group were the cones, so hopefully the keeper would save a lot of shots. They decided because after eight days running ourselves into the ground to play like men possessed. The team attacking <laughs> didn't get a shot. Timo Lukowski was my instructor. Uh, Timo became a good friend. Yeah, uh, that's uh, the the funny coaching license stories yeah there's a final question here tim and then we'll wrap up and let you get back to you three little nippers um it says how would you develop the the youths of today to retain them so that's why that we from... did the, yeah that's why grassroots that was all the grassroots purpose it was all about player retention we sat in a room we looked at the retention rates uh, we looked at the number of players leaving the games in drove and just believed we'd all we got it wrong we all sat there and said well we're obviously not doing it right we're losing players at all ages for all different reasons and that was the birth of the grassroots co courses let's change a situation where 80 percent of the kids leave by 13 years of age nobody yeah. can be that's why we're all fighting over players we've drove so many away we have to fight over the people we've got left yeah let's reverse it yeah race to the bottom getting them in younger and younger and so on and so forth but tim brilliant thank you very much um thanks for joining us thanks for sharing your time with us your knowledge in such a such a good way i think there's another question let me in oh thanks for the insight jeff and your um thanks jeff as well again just want to thank everybody especially tim and thank everybody who who's watching this live everybody who will watch this later just want to encourage people remember we are safe at home not stuck at home we do have opportunities through this to learn just like tim's been doing and debbie with their sign language but uh we will not only get through this we will grow through this together uh we've got a couple three more webinars this month and uh some some brilliant ones and and again keep learning keep growing and uh players first people first even like uk coaching say tim any final words yeah, great work, and I thank you. Thank you for everything you're doing. Ah, uh, thank you. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Standing on the shoulders of giants. So take care, everybody. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. All right.